I got an early Christmas present from my family and I want to start working on it immediately. I'm going to do a new enclosure build for my Monocentropus Balfouri communal. Hello tarantula lovers and welcome back to Tarantula Haven. Why am I outside? Well, for one, it's a beautiful day. It's been raining here for the past few days in Florida and the sun has finally come out, so it's nice to be outside. For two, I'm gonna be working with chemicals that release fumes and I don't wanna harm my animals, my family, or myself. So I wanna make sure that I'm out here where it's well ventilated. So what I'm doing today is I'm creating a new vivarium build for my Monocentropus Balfouri communal. This is a dream that I've had ever since I bought those tarantulas. I've been thinking about how I wanna set them up. I wanted to set them up in a certain way that was naturalistic in a desert-like environment, but I also wanted to incorporate certain things into that vision. And when I went to Repticon on my last video, I had purchased an enclosure for it. And the one that I got was the Exoterra 12 by 12 by 12. And when I brought it home and I thought about how I was going to design it and everything, I think I just found out or I figured that that was just not big enough for my vision. So I decided to go bigger. I should have bought the bigger one while I was there, but it was just not in my head just yet. I didn't quite visualize it yet. So I looked everywhere that I know, all my local pet shops, all the ones that are nearby and so on, and nobody had the 18 by 18 by 18 Exoterra. So um, after exhausting all of my resources, I almost settled on one and, and it was not the one that I wanted. But then I called Extreme Exotics in Jacksonville. I'm going to give them a little plug here. And they told me that they had two enclosures of the 18 by 18 by 18, but they had it in the Zoom Ed version. Now, I use that for my um, Syriopagopus lividus and I liked it. I was going for the, the um, Exoterra when I did that. And I ended up liking the Zoom Ed because it has the large glass front on it. And so does this one. So I think I'm actually going to be happy with this one. So thank you so much to Extreme Exotics for having it. <laughs> and uh, it ended up being a good trip because when we went there, they just have all kinds of enclosures, lots and lots of tarantulas and anything you can imagine reptile wise. They got all kinds of stuff there as well. So if you are in the Jacksonville area, definitely check out Extreme Exotics. You won't be disappointed pointed and their prices are pretty good too. I've been dreaming about this enclosure for quite some time now and my vision that I have in my head is to make some kind of desert scape that has twisted wood and lots of tunnels and rocks and things like that. And I even have this skull that I've been holding on to for about two to three years, I think. And that's how long I've been thinking about this and what I wanted to do. So um, I definitely want to incorporate that and maybe even make this part of an entrance to a tunnel or something. But I do want to add that into the enclosure. So obviously I've had a lot of time to think about this. What I've also thought about is this enclosure right here is 18 by 18 by 18 and it is made of glass. 
by itself, it weighs about 30 pounds. Sorry, there's an airplane flying overhead. But by itself, it weighs about 30 pounds. So it's pretty heavy alone. It does have a cork bark background in there that does add a little bit of weight, but not that much. So I'm gonna chunk that out. I'm not gonna use that in here because I don't want it to have that wooden background. So I'll probably use that for something else. But what I do wanna do is to design a different background for it. And the problem that I have is how do I take a 30 pound enclosure and add things in there that will make it look like a desert scape, like sand or gravel or rocks and things like that, but still keep it as light as possible. Because if you go too heavy with the things that you put in there, for one, you're not gonna be able to move it around very easily. So it's gonna become something that you sit somewhere and it's gonna be permanently there because you can't move it. And you could crack the bottom of it. You put too much weight inside of an enclosure, that bottom glass will not support that weight and it can crack and then you have to buy a new enclosure and start all over again. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna design this vivarium and I'm gonna show you how to keep it as light as possible but still make it look like a desert scape. At least I hope so. To start, I used pre-cut foam to create a sloped area where I was gonna make the tarantula den. I used a little bit of hot glue to hold it in place just long enough for me to foam it later on. I started out using the Great Stuff window and door foam, which my daughter told me was the wrong stuff she used because it doesn't expand as much and when it hardens, it hardens spongy and soft and not as hard as the other stuff that she recommended I use. So I ended up using it just for the den area and later on I switched to the appropriate stuff. Once I carved it to the desired shape, I used black silicone as an adhesive. I used excavator clay on the black silicone to give it a naturalistic appearance. And I know I said I was gonna work outside because of the fumes, but it got extremely windy out there, not to mention the sun went down and I lost the light, so I had to bring it inside. I did use an exhaust fan in the window so that it would blow all the fumes outside, and I put it in the garage to dry. And here I'm creating more of the den area with the purple foam. And I probably should have done this all in one fell swoop at the beginning, but I wasn't really sure where I was gonna go with it. So I ended up having to do it afterward. And this is where the entrance to the burrow or the den is going to be. And I used the rest of the uh, Great Stuff window and door foam to finish it out just to keep it all uniform.
And here I'm using an old foam background as flooring. And what this does is it gives the appearance of a deep substrate when in fact you don't have to use as much. This will save you a ton on weight because you only have to put a little bit of substrate toward the front and some that I'm gonna put inside the den area. And the rest is just gonna be kind of a mock substrate. And here I'm using the Great Stuff Gaps and Cracks foam. It comes in the red can, and this is the appropriate stuff that my daughter said to use because it expands so much more and it hardens much harder than the other stuff. I've reached the point where I'm ready to carve and this part's a little bit daunting because this is where the artistic part comes in. Everything up, up until this point is pretty much just build up. You're just building your materials up so that you can go in there and carve it out. But I'm having a little bit of a problem. The problem is when you're working with foam, it's best if you work in small layers but when you work in small layers, unfortunately, even though the can says it's reusable, the foam tends to harden up inside the tube. And when you go to use it again, it never quite flows out the way it did when it's brand new. So I went ahead and used up a whole can at a time building up my walls and everything. But the problem with that is that the outer portion tends to harden up and it forms a seal on the inner portion where it doesn't get much air or doesn't get any air at all. And that part really slows down and it doesn't dry up. So when it doesn't dry up, you're sitting there with a gooey mess on the inside just waiting for you when you go to carve it. So I went and I took some dowels and I poked some holes from the top down on the side where the glass is to kind of ventilate those areas and see if I could get them to dry a little bit faster. But they do start to dry, but then they seal up all over again and then they stay wet on the inside. So I have to keep going in there and ventilating and it's just taking too long. So what I'm considering doing is going in there and going ahead and carving it. And whenever I encounter those wet areas, just kind of stop there and allow those to dry. Maybe even dig out some of that stuff because it's not all going to be there as far as the the landscape or the topography is going to be but I just want to make sure that I get my design down so that I can go ahead and maybe if there's areas that are wet and are pockets of empty space in there I can fill those in and those won't take forever to dry they'll actually harden pretty quickly so that's what I'm going to deal with here so I think I'm going to go ahead and start carving and just deal with the wet spots as they come up. So you can clearly see here kind of what I'm going for. I've got the walls built up. I've got the tunnel that leads down to the den right here. I'm going to be carving a lot of this out. It's built up quite a bit, but there is going to be a lot of carving to do. Um, the reason I want these so thick like this is because I want to make some ledges and I want to be able to make holes in there where I could actually put plants in there um, inside little pots, but still kind of conceal them to where they look natural. And I've got a lot of carving out to do do, but it seems to be working out just fine. It's just kind of daunting visualizing what I'm going to do before I actually start the carving. And this is what I'm talking about here. You can see the wider areas over here. Those are the areas that have dried out. And right here, this yellow spot right there, that is where it's still wet. So um, it did dry out quite a bit. You can see right up here where I ventilated and it has dried down into the foam itself. But I've still got that yellow spot right there that still hasn't dried out. And on the back here, there are some areas right there close to the den area where you can see it's still liquid right there. So that still needs to dry out. And then down below is where the den is. And this is where they're pretty much going to spend a great deal of their time. So I wanted to kind of make that natural. And I think I'm going to leave that open as a window so that I can look in on them whenever I want. Mm -hmm. 
So you can see here the area where I reached the gooey foam and it hadn't hardened or anything when I was cutting it out. It was actually still wet there. This is dried overnight. I left it overnight, so it's now hardened. But um, what I could do for this, I could either go back in there and spray a little bit more foam, or I've been kind of saving my pieces of foam that I've been cutting out. And it wouldn't be anything for me to go ahead and cut out a shape and just fill that in and stick it on there. And it would just add to the rock-like appearance, that fragmented appearance that I'm kind of going for anyway. So it's not that big of a deal. I just wish I had anticipated that ahead of time. I would have done this a little bit differently. I, if I had to do this over, I would anticipate where I was going to put my rock ledges and probably put in some cutout foam in those places ahead of time so that I would have something, some kind of surface to foam on. And that way there would not be as big a distribution of foam like this and have pockets where it would not dry. I would have smaller areas where it would dry a lot easier. So. You know, live and learn, but that's just one of those things that I take away from that. Next time I'll do a better job. Oh, and if you are wondering about this pink light that's shining through right here, that's not done for effect. That's actually my grow lights that are here on my desk and I use that to help my plants grow. And sometimes when I am recording a video of a tarantula on my table or something like that, um, you, those lights are on and it adds to the effect and a lot of people comment on how beautiful it is and it's just not on purpose. It's because I have my grow lights go in there and I forget to turn them off sometimes. So here's another trouble spot right here. I carved through that. I'm trying to find a place to put the uh, skull. I want to have it laying here, but I also want it to have a cave going down or a tunnel going down into the den. So um, I'm trying to carve out a little spot for it, but I hit some gooey, some gooey foam back here. So I'm going to have to clean that up a little bit, but no big deal. Again, live and learn. I'm using a Dremel tool with a cutting disc on it to create the lines and cracks in the foam to create the appearance of stone. This creates a lot of dust, so it's advised to use a mask or respirator for this part. So I don't know if you noticed this earlier, but I created a little pocket right here. And the reason I created that pocket was so that I could put a plant in there and I could stick a little potted plant and keep it in there inconspicuous. But um, this was one of the areas where when I dug through, it ended up being in a, a gushy area where it didn't quite dry behind the, uh, the hardened foam. So um, it's dried now, but it left me with kind of an open space right there because it shows the glass. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill that in using some of the leftover foam that I have, um, pieces that I've cut off. I'm gonna cut little pieces and just kind of fill that in so that it doesn't show back there and um, it also holds the pot nice and tight in there and I can add a little bit of buildup to the sides just to kind of make it less conspicuous. And I'm working with hot glue here, but I keep it on the low temperature setting so that um, it doesn't melt the foam too much because it will melt the foam a little bit, but sometimes that just kind of helps adhere it, but it won't melt it too much on the low setting. And I'm gonna do the same thing with this area right here to cover up that glass part right there. I just need to fill that in. So I can cut out some parts and just fill them in as needed. Once again, I'm using silicone and excavator clay to give the appearance of a sandy soil bottom.
to paint and seal the walls, I'm using Drylock Concrete and Masonry Waterproofer. To give it that reddish tint, I'm using Quick Crete Cement Color, and I chose the Terracotta for this. And be careful if you're using this because a little bit goes a very long way. For the finishing touches, I dabbed a little bit of extra paint in different colors onto the red to give it a more stone-like appearance. I also added some more silicone on the ledges and I sprinkled excavator clay for a more natural look. Be sure to clean up any extra stuff around the edges to give it a more finished look. I've got this gorgeous piece of spider wood that I found that I really wanted to add to this build, but I couldn't make it balance. I just couldn't find a spot. I was trying to put some, put it down low or something and it just wasn't working out. But fortunately my daughter kind of helped me out and she helped me place it to where it looked really good. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and use it anyway. I wanted to add some natural plants in here, but I just didn't have the room for it. So I decided to get some plastic succulents to just stick onto the sides and I use hot glue to put those in. And I wasn't happy with how bare it looked, so I decided I needed to add a little bit more natural looking shrubbery and things like that. So I went to Hobby Lobby and I found some dried grasses and twigs and I created little shrubs out of those to put in there to give it a more natural appearance as well. I don't like seeing the exposed foam on the sides of the back of the enclosure, so I bought some blackout window film. This stuff is really inexpensive and easy to use and I highly recommend it for this type of build. In my opinion, it gives it a nice finished look and it looks very professional as well. As a final touch, I added some jungle mix substrate into the den area and a little bit up in the front. And I did this to hold moisture because this is a very dry enclosure because of all the foam. It, it's not gonna hold a whole lot of moisture. And of course the tarantulas are gonna need moisture in order for them to molt properly and so on. So this way I can just wet in specific areas and that will increase the humidity in the enclosure when needed. And also of course, I'm gonna keep a water dish in there as well. 
I also added a final layer of Exoterra Stone Desert to kind of top off the soil that I put out in the front and to kind of give it a more stony appearance all over. And now comes the moment of truth. I started this on December 22nd and I had every expectation of finishing it before the new year, but that just wasn't gonna happen. There were certain mistakes that I had made along the way, things that in hindsight I would do differently. I did consult with my daughter a little bit because she had done a build like this, but I think I should have listened to her more. One of my biggest issues was the foam. If I had to do this over again, I would not layer up the foam as much as I did, or I would probably build it up with um, other other pieces of dry foam before I put in the spray foam because there were issues where I built it up too much and uh, the outside foam dried out before the inside foam. So the foam on the inside that was up against the glass stayed wet. The outside formed a, a nice seal around it so it would not get any air and it just constantly stayed wet. So it was a really hard time to get that to dry out. I had to perforate the foam to allow air to get inside and activate that liquid foam so that it could dry out and foam up like it should. So that took a, a large portion of my time away because I couldn't exactly cut into the foam while it was still wet. And even though um, <laughs> you know I was still waiting and I had perforated it, I still had to cut into the foam while it was still wet and dig some of that out and rebuild it up. So it was a major issue that I would most likely avoid next time around if I do a build like this by doing it differently. Another thing that slowed down my time was using the dry lock paint that I used to seal the outside of the foam. Um, I use that because a lot of people that keep poison dart frogs and create these these moisture vivariums, um, they use that because it does form a nice seal around everything and I suppose it's non-toxic once it dries out and everything. So um, yeah, that, that paint is a little bit thicker than most of your acrylic paints and things like that. Plus it's a little bit texturized. So in areas where it tended to pool up a little bit, it took longer to dry. So it took a couple of days for those spots to dry out. I would have used a heat gun, but I was afraid I would have melted my foam. So I just let it dry naturally, which of course took a lot of time out. And finally, the other thing that took time away from me was the extra little fine details that I added to it. Once I finished the entire thing, I looked at it and I was like, it just doesn't look right. It's, it's bare. It needs something. So I decided I was going to add some shrubbery here and there um, to, to kind of bring it out to make it look a little bit more natural. And I had intended to put live plants in there and create pockets where I can put little pots and stuff in there so that I could have these live plants. And I did create one where I can switch out a live plant in there if I wanted to, but there just wasn't enough room. Even though I went with the 18 by 18, it did not give me enough room to do that without building up the walls too much. And I really, really didn't want to do that. So I kind of nixed that early on. I made one area for the live plants and we'll see how that works out. If it doesn't work out, then I'll probably change it up in the future. But I kind of like it and it gives me the option to switch out a live plant here and there so I can have a different live plant um, you know, at different times. And the other thing, of course was getting the materials. Um, if you were wondering how I made the little twigs and the shrubbery and stuff, I went to Hobby Lobby and I picked up these dried um, plants, I guess. They're little little twigs and they're, they're just all kinds of different dried grasses and stuff. And what I did is I clipped them down into smaller pieces and I hot glued the, the bases on them to create a little shrub and then I just popped them into little holes that I created in the foam. So um, it wasn't so much doing that that took time away, but going out during the holidays, buying that stuff and looking for it because I couldn't find it. You know, I went to different places like Michael's and Joann's and I ended up finding it at Hobby Lobby. So, you know, it took a little shopping to find exactly what I needed. 
So finally, this is my Monocentropus Balfouri communal right here. The enclosure that it's in is actually a makeshift one that I made out of a basketball or ball display case that I also bought at Hobby Lobby. And as you can see, they've kind of webbed it all up and clouded it all up and everything. So it's not very good to, to display or view or anything. So they're going from this to a mansion, I guess you would call it. And I'm really happy about that. Um, I know... I have six. I had six. I don't know if I still have six, but I haven't bothered them in a while. People have been asking me for an update on them. And the reason I haven't given an update, of course, this is not exactly the best looking enclosure and setup anymore. It did look pretty good when I first put them in there, but not so much anymore. But if you buy Monocentropus Balfouri, you will have a hard time seeing them sometimes. They do go dormant for a little while, especially in the winter time. And then you wonder how many do you have? Are they still in there? Did they eat each other and all that kind of stuff? Um, I have seen them out here and there, usually at night. The most I've seen out at one time is five. And there's always that one, that six one that I could never find and never see. And in the past, I've dug them out, re rehoused them and everything, and I always find them. But it's usually in there, he or she, I don't know. Um, I kind of find it weird that I, I do see five females out and the sixth one, I never know because I don't know which one it is or anything like that. So I don't know if it, if I've got six females in here, if I got that lucky or if the one that I don't see is, is a male. But I would assume that I would probably see the male out if I did have a male in here because they'll be out bothering the females and trying to breed with them and everything. And it would have sexually matured by now. So um, I don't know, maybe I'm lucky and I got all six in there and they're all six females or maybe the one that's missing has died off and maybe it matured a male and died since and I just haven't seen it yet. So who knows? We're going to find out today. So let's go ahead and get them in their new enclosure and see how they like it. All right, so let's do this and let's see if we can get them transferred without any escapes. I'm much more prepared this time. I've got six deli cups here ready. Last time I tried to put them into one single enclosure and that just was a mess. So let's see, where do I start? We got several burrows going on here. Let me break up the web here. Hope nobody comes out to greet me. They're usually really skittish and they run off. But I have had one give me a threat posture before and stand and stridulate at me which I thought was really cool. I didn't realize they stridulated. All right. Let's get these sticks off. I think I glued them together, I sure did. All right, here we go. Not seeing anybody yet. Guess I better have my tongs and stuff ready. I think I need to get a little plastic tub to put the uh, substrate in as I go. So I'll be right back. Big girl. There's one. There they are. All right. Oh, 
There's another one. There's two. Five. And now the elusive number six. Boy, that's a fat girl. And there we go, all six. Isn't that a beautiful sight?
There they are, the famous Monocentropus Balfouri sisters. I am so happy that all six are still there considering I've only seen five out at one time and they all seem to be healthy and doing well so I'm really glad about that. And I don't know what I did to get so lucky to end up with six females but there you have it. Six females out of the whole bunch. I expected to get one or two males. So I guess I'm on the lookout for a male to introduce into the communal and see what happens. Now I do know that they tend to not breed when they are in a communal setting with few exceptions. I have heard of a couple of people out there that have had success in breeding in a communal setting, but for the most part, a lot of people uh, report that they don't, that they end up not breeding. So I don't know if that's because they are sack mates or what but you know if you introduce a male from a different sack maybe it might be a different story but a lot of people will tend to breed them by pulling out a single female and keeping her solitary and then introducing a male now if you do tend to keep one solitary then i wouldn't recommend putting it in into a communal setting or putting anything into the solitary setting with the female because if you do that then the likelihood of cannibalization is very high so i would avoid anything like that one thing you do have to understand about Monocentropus balfouri is they are burrowers. And especially if you have smaller communals, you will tend to see less activity. So sometimes you'll see a lot of activity and you'll see them out and about, especially during feeding time. But then there's times when they have periods where they go dormant or they will, I guess, hibernate. They stay in the, in the burrows and they won't come out for long periods of time. So I've had cases where I haven't seen them in about three months and uh, they might maybe stick some legs out or you know you might see them at the mouth of a burrow but for the most part they stay subterranean so just understand that and uh, I would really really avoid getting into huge communals that doesn't seem to be a problem here in the United States given their expense they're usually run about $50 or more per spider but um, I do know that in the UK they tend to be a whole lot cheaper and I've seen people in the UK that are getting communals of a hundred or more. Now in my opinion I think that's a little bit too much if you start doing communals like that Yes, you'll see a whole lot of activity, but I couldn't imagine the feeding bill of feeding all those baby tarantulas or all those tarantulas in that communal setting. Not to mention, you really truly never know how many you have unless you do a count when you do a rehousing or something like that. For the most part, you really have no clue that you have all 100 still there. So it's kind of tough to keep track of everybody, especially when it comes to feeding. You know, some of these tarantulas will grab one or two crickets or roaches or anything like that when you feed them so if you throw an exact number in there then of course you don't know who's getting fed and who's missing out although they do tend to share food sometimes sometimes you'll end up with some of them that will not get food and they'll end up smaller and weaker and may get preyed upon so I would really avoid any large communal settings my recommendation would be about 10. Um, maybe a few more, maybe a few less like mine, but at least five in a communal is pretty good. But I would recommend keeping your communal small just so that you know how many you have and you can keep track of feeding a whole lot easier. There are other tarantula species that can be kept communally, but as far as I'm concerned, they are not truly communal like the Monocentropus balfouri. Um, Pasilotheria will tolerate each other up to a certain point, but then usually if you go be Beyond that point, then you end up with one big fat tarantula and the rest of them get eaten, or you might lose a few in the process and still only have a few left. Neoholophilae insei, I've heard some good things about those. They can be kept communally, but I've also heard horror stories about them as well. So not always the case where they get along well and sometimes they end up getting eaten. Um, and Hysterocrates gigas, I think, is another species that people keep communally. And some of them do successfully. I believe Petco of Dark Den has a Hysterocrates communal. But... Um, there are cases where a lot of them will eat each other. So, you know, if you have a lot of losses and there's a track record of people's communals crashing like that, then in my opinion, they are not truly communal. I've had these guys for going on four years now. Six of them is what I started out with and I still have all six. So I see a lot of success from other people. Not everybody is that lucky. There are some people that suffer losses, but I don't know how they keep their communals, whether they water them enough or whether they feed them enough. So sometimes when those things happen, you can end up with some cannibalization that goes on. But overall, they're very rewarding and they're really cool to keep together. 
So I hope everybody had happy holidays. Happy New Year to you. I hope that this new year is prosperous and brings lots of good things to you. Thank you to Extreme Exotics. I've got another video coming up that is associated with them or is related to them because they loaned me a male of a certain species. So I'm going to do a breeding video of that. So look forward to that. If you are from Florida and happen to be in the Jacksonville area, check out Extreme Exotics. That does it for me today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give me a like. If you want to see more, subscribe. If you want to support this channel, I have a Teespring store where I sell Tarantula Haven merchandise. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. And if you'd like to become a patron yourself, there's a link down below in the description, as well as all the others. Until next time, keep loving them tarantulas.